Hello, welcome to our session today on the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to focus on the textual strategy, uh, the textual strategies of Matthew, in particular uh, the ones that cut across the entire book. So we'll be focusing on uh, one of the major textual patterns in Matthew uh, today. We're going to revisit this structure that we've spoken about before and then draw out some of the implications of that uh, textual pattern, that structural pattern in the book of Matthew as a whole. I wanted to start today in Matthew chapter 13. This is one of those uh, major, the end of one of those major discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Um, and I have the key text that I want us to consider on the screen. Okay, Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to start in verse 44. Matthew writes uh, and records Jesus' words here in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it is filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out of the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them in the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasures both old and new. All right, well, let me uh, pray for us here, and then we will get started. Father, thank you for allowing us to meet together in this format. And I pray that you would um, uh, bless our time together uh, and honor our effort as we seek to understand uh, your word and behold wonderful things from the Gospel of Matthew. We do love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, well, I want us to think about Matthew 13, in particular these two verses here at the end. This is, of course, at the end of a long discourse um, in chapter 13, where uh, Matthew is recording Jesus' series of parables. Uh, parables about the kingdom and the way that this ends as it comes to an end Jesus turns to his disciples and asks have you understood all these things so this focuses uh, the attention of this section on uh, the meaning of what Jesus has been saying so it's a hermeneutical uh, position positioning here of this statement uh, which is as we'll talk about uh, later, when we think about the nature of parables, part of a parable is similar to a poetic text in that when you're under, when you're reading a parable or hearing a parable, one of the key tasks is to it slows you down as you're trying to think uh, what aspects of the story relate to what uh, the speaker or the author is trying to say. So when Jesus is speaking a parable about the kingdom, uh, a fishing analogy or uh, a hunting analogy. Uh, finding a treasure. Uh, what is it about that story? Uh, what is it about that parabolic discourse that relates to what Jesus is seeking to communicate? What is it maybe an argument that he's trying to make uh, or a point that he's trying to illustrate? So in that sense, part of the function of parables is to create in the reader uh, a hermeneutical deliberation. What is meant by these words, right? So Jesus says to them after this, after he asks, have they understood everything? And then he pushes further after they've uh, answered in the affirmative. Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, and this is what he's been talking about, the kingdom of heaven, the, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. Uh, every scribe who has become a disciple of this kingdom that he's just been talking about is like a head of a household who brings out of his storehouses or his treasure things old and new, or new and old. Uh, so the key concepts here that I wanted to just briefly uh, discuss, because it, it relates to what we've been doing uh, 
recently in our class discussions is grappling with the book of Matthew as a whole. We're seeking to pull out uh, certain themes or detect certain strategies uh, in the book as a whole and relate those things together. Uh, so one of the key concepts here at the beginning is therefore every scribe uh, who has become a disciple. So a scribe here, uh, there's the idea of one trained in the interpretation of text, the uh, copying uh, and interpretation of text. So in, if you're in a situation or a social setting where there are certain uh, individuals who are responsible for the copying and production of texts, uh, sometimes they also become perceived of as experts of handling those texts or interpreting those texts. So the interpretation of text is sometimes um, connected to the scribal activity of passing them along. So it's not only the center of production, but in some ways the center of hermeneutical authority. Uh, so in the Gospels you see the scribes of the Pharisees or the scribes of the Sadducees or sometimes just scribes in general. Um, this is part of uh, what is being referred to those who are handling the text, uh, producing the text, copying the text, um, and here in general, one who is trained in the interpretation of text, who can uh, not only produce the author's text, but also follow the author's textual intention. So this is an important concept. It's uh, hermeneutical. Uh, it's, it involves reading. It involves uh, understanding the way that the words go. So Jesus here employs this uh, image, uh, this status, uh, this position, and he connects it to the idea of another major theme in his gospel, which is discipleship, so a disciple. Uh, so he connects this concept of a scribe to one who, a disciple who believes and heeds the message of these texts. Um, so not only understands these texts, but it believes what he reads or is hearing. Uh, in the context of Jesus' uh, discourse. Uh, so related to the scribe, one who can follow the author's textual intention. A scribe who has become a disciple is one who can follow the lead of the master. So following Jesus as a major theme and also understanding text, two major themes in the Gospels, uh, and in particular something that Matthew highlights. Uh, and then the last part of this, as he's pulling these together, a wise discipled scribe, a wise scribe who has become a disciple, and here, this is hermeneutical activity, this interpretive task of one who knows how the words of Jesus uh, and the words of scriptures fit together. So not only knowing the words of Jesus, knowing the words of scripture, but also how they fit together. How does Jesus' teaching, Jesus' person and work, relate to the scriptures, the work of God and the person of God from the scriptures? Um, and then also how can that person speak and live on the basis of them, of those words? So here, a wise head of a household who is bringing out of his treasure things new and old. So having to decide and determine what is new, what is old, how does it relate together? And in this specific context, when something needs to be brought out, what is being brought out, right? So pulling together um, this. So in the uh, context of a the end of a series of parables, uh, the the issue of interpretation is front and center. And so this image of a scribe who understands texts and a disciple who believes and heeds the message of these texts and who is also able to put all these things together and communicate those uh, that truth uh, when necessary, when needed. Uh, so it's just a, a wonderful image here uh, in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew that I want us to connect to our uh, study of the book as a whole as we see Matthew functioning as a scribe who has become a disciple, who has brought together in his gospel words old and new, the scriptures, but also the words of Jesus, and then shown through that the path to being a disciple. And so the book as a whole, Matthew himself, in the composition of this book, is doing this, what Jesus is saying. He's a scribe who has become a disciple who has then brought together things old and new, and through the composition of his gospel and the, the canonical uh, passing along of this gospel in the context of canon, Matthew has now equipped readers of this gospel to do the same thing, to become a scribe who is also a disciple, who is also wise. All right. So this is a really interesting 
uh, thing or concept that Jesus is pulling together and articulating here, but also I think connects to Matthew's purpose in writing and the primary intention of the book uh, for readers, right? So this is a really exciting image um, here. Okay, so I want us to connect that to what we were taught, we've been talking about, which is the structure and the shape of the book of Matthew as a whole. And so remember, we've been talking about Matthew's compositional strategies, and one of the major textual patterns in Matthew is the strategic use of discourse. In the Gospel of Matthew, as we've looked at, uh, there are five major blocks of discourse. We could call them uh, the five major sermons or uh, teachings of Jesus in the book, something that sets apart Matthew uh, as distinctive uh, among the Gospels is the way that he does this. Uh, so Matthew begins with the book and birth of Jesus the Christ, the book of the genealogies. Now the birth of Jesus the Christ happened in this way. And then the final narrative and the final discourse in chapters 28 as we're looking at the crucifixion and resurrection uh, and also the final words of Jesus to the disciples. Uh, and in between, we're seeing uh, what we've called five major movements of Matthew, uh, which are marked out by a block of narrative, followed by a block of discourse. And in each movement, we get a uh, series of narratives, scenes, uh, and a series of uh, blocks of discourse. Um, so as we looked at, in some ways we want to connect the blocks of discourse are the major movements to one another. And so part of the way we can see that is as we move from major movement to major movement, we can see the story progressing, the narrative is going along. But as we see this structure, we can see that um, once we've noted this pattern, we can detect some of the major themes that are developed in the discourse sections. So when Jesus goes to speak in Matthew, uh, and Matthew is pulling these uh, uh, words together. Uh, we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount uh, as Jesus's sermon, as expectations are the demands of the kingdom, uh, and then the going out of that message uh, with the missionary, the uh, disciples on their journey, uh, the proclamation of the kingdom. Here we looked at just now the parables of the kingdom, uh, chapter 18, emphasizing the nature of the community, the community in the kingdom. Uh, and then the future of the kingdom or judgment in the kingdom, right? So some of this is homiletical, the Sermon on the Mount. Some of this is parabolic discourse, the, a series of parables. Some of this is eschatological discourse. Um, so there is a diversity here among the discourse sections, but there's also continuity, both continuity of theme uh, and also some verbal and thematic parallels that we want to note. So we can see this is one of the ways to get a handle on the book of Matthew is how do these discourse sections relate to one another uh, and how do they interplay with the narratives uh, surrounding them? And so that's the other thing that we want to take note of is as we're seeing this as a textual strategy that cuts across the entire gospel, uh, we can see that this is something that uh, if we get a handle on this, we can get a handle on uh, what's going on in the book. right? And so we've... Uh, left off thinking about the uh, importance of the strategic summary sections in Matthew. So all throughout these, as we move from one movement to the next, oftentimes what marks out those movements is a strategic summary section that, that draws, us, draws attention to the fact that these words are extended and that they are, uh, Jesus is, um, has extended teaching that the people are responding to uh, but that also it's connected to an ongoing narrative, uh, right? So this is one of the reasons we see this as a major textual strategy that cuts across the entire book that helps us get a handle on what Matthew is up to, what is his compositional strategy. Uh, so to, uh, today, the, my major goal is to just think about the implications of this textual strategy. Um, and so I just want to briefly talk about these here, which we'll set up in our next major discussions as we start looking at um, the, the beginning of Matthew, the genealogy, the birth narrative, um, and the infancy narrative here uh, as we move forward, as Matthew sets up his gospel. We want to keep this larger structure, this larger pattern, uh, continually in mind uh, as we're thinking about uh, the individual passages within this. So one of the first uh, major implications of this textual strategy is it helps us discern book-level meaning. 
uh, to begin thinking about Matthew as a compositional whole. Um, so this is one of the, I would say, the key features of thinking about the structure of a book is it convinces us that Matthew has a plan for his gospel. There is a purpose that not only relates to recording a series of Jesus' words, but there is a purpose that cuts across all of these discourse blocks or these major discourse sections. Uh, so we want to be thinking about why has Matthew included these elements and omitted these other elements? Why has he chosen to uh, give us the discourse that he has in the way that he has? So thinking not only of the content, but also the means by which it's delivered, right? So seeing a textual strategy like this, that um, as we talked about before, one of the major features or a main strategy of reading a narrative, what comes at the beginning and what comes at the end. Often this is a key in narrative as to find an author's purpose in the book is to think, how does he begin? How does he set it up? And how does he bring it all to a close? Um, so oftentimes we can see textual, verbal, and thematic links between these uh, locations in the narrative. Uh, and one of the things that that helps us see is book level meaning. Uh, the purpose of Matthew as he composes the entire book. And that will help us get a handle on what comes in between. So that's just a general comment about a strategy like this. This is one of the reasons why it's helpful to think about it and to uh, seek to detect it. Uh, and secondly, specifically, it helps us make textual connections that we may have missed if we haven't been thinking about this book level framework. Um, so as I mentioned before, the beginnings and end of the Gospels, on uh, any narrative, but the Gospel narratives in particular, uh, we can see some development that's really interesting uh, and it's important not to miss. So we can think about this on a micro level. Uh, so for example, the, in the middle of the birth narrative, or the infancy narrative here, as uh, Matthew is recording to the, uh, the lead up to the actual birth of Matthew, of Jesus, not of Matthew, uh, which is remarkably fast um, and almost in passing, as we'll look at uh, what, so what is the significance of Jesus's actual birth being uh, just mentioned in passing. Uh, but in verse 20, uh, this is where the angel is speaking to Joseph, uh, verse 20. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, uh, saying, Joseph. Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. So here Matthew is speaking now. He records the angel's words, uh, and then now he reflects upon that. So it's a narration and interpretation here. So all this took place of Phil was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, quote, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, end quote. Uh, and we'll look at the, um, this is a combined quotation from Isaiah, but Matthew points out he translates this uh, by using another text from Isaiah, uh, translates Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So we could ask, why is Matthew giving us the translation here in this particular instance? I think one of the reasons is that he's highlighting this idea of God's presence among the people. So the idea that uh, in the birth of this child, uh, this is the means by which God is present in this particular way, in this particular moment with the people. Of course, marking the, um, the theological um, explosive point that uh, in the incarnation, in the birth of Jesus, this one that will save his people from their sins, God himself is with us, right? So thinking about that as a major theme at the beginning of the book, that this Jesus who we will see through the rest of the book, just called Jesus, and we see Jesus doing things, saying things, this is the means by which God is with us. So now that we move to the end of the book, uh, convinced that there's a book level meaning, we come to the last words of the book uh, after the resurrection. And Matthew records the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, behold, 
highlight. This is an important moment. One, it's be the, the last words of the text, the last words of the risen Christ in the book of Matthew, but also Jesus himself is saying, Lo, uh, behold, uh, don't miss this. And then he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here there's an emphasis on the presence of Jesus, um, the presence of God with the people. So thinking about uh, even after he's gone. So thinking about the beginning, the way that the beginning, uh, the book begins with this emphasis on God with us. And then here at the end, there's an emphasis on Jesus with us, even to the end of the age. Uh, so this is a high Christology as we're moving from God with us to Jesus with us. Um, and then this is the means by which uh, God is present among his people, even to the end of the age. And so this is something, too, that most likely is connecting with the last major block of discourse, chapter 24 and 25, where Jesus is giving an eschatological in, uh, discourse on the end of days. Uh, and here he's saying, I am with you always, even to the end of that age that I am myself had envisioned before the crucifixion, right? So this is a post-resurrection return or echo of end of days discourse. And one of the things that's um, emphasized is going back and echoing that initial theological uh, landmine or gold mine uh, at the beginning of the gospel that God is with us in this one who is born and God is with us in this one who has been resurrected and is giving us this great commission, right? So we'll, we'll make more of that and there's much more to say uh, relating the great commission to the life, birth, ministry, death, resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but this is uh, the point here is that the textual strategy of blocks of narrative and discourse have helped us understand that there's a meaning at the level of the whole. Uh, so there's a book level meaning. And so that helps highlight what comes first and what comes last. And we see this textual and thematic theme that is directly connected to uh, Matthew's theology. So on a micro level, uh, textual dis um connections on a macro level uh, think about the amount and distinct pattern of discourse uh, so this would be one of the major features of matthew that he's uh, developing this idea of jesus as teacher by giving us teaching from jesus um, think about the uh, command in the great commission therefore make disciples of all nations baptizing them but also teaching them to observe all that i commanded you so we can we might ask well, what has been commanded and how do we have access to that? And Matthew, because he is a scribe who has become a disciple and put these things together for us, we too as readers can be scribes who can become disciples um, on the basis of reading and rereading this particular book, right? This particular gospel. So that's another exciting thing about as we're thinking about this textual strategy, one of the means, one of the implications is that this is the means by which we, hostile Gentiles, years and years later, can now uh, follow the Jewish Messiah. Uh, now we can, too, be his disciples. We now can observe all that he has commanded. And the promise is that on the basis of that belief, on the basis of that uh, discipleship, uh, he will be with us even to the end of the age. So that's pretty, that's pretty, pretty high up on the needle meter, uh, right, in my opinion. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So as we move from, uh, so it helps us make textual commission connections we might have missed uh, without this book level meaning framework. Uh, a few other things that helps guides our Christological reflection on the person and work of Jesus as the Christ. So one of the, uh, this is another way of saying some of the things we've already said. One of the distinct uh, benefits of this pattern of narrative and discourse is that the person of Jesus, the words of Jesus, and the works of Jesus are brought together for us. Things new and old are brought together uh, as we're looking at, because at this point, the actions and words of Jesus would be one of those things that are old, right? This happened in the past. Uh, maybe the new thing is this resurrection and the life of the community, but Matthew's drawing those together and saying, by implication of the uh, uh, impact of this gospel, is that the discipleship, and following Jesus means reading his book, uh, means thinking about the enduring relevance of the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, and then in seeing those in connection with his death and resurrection and the 
current work of the Spirit uh, mediating the presence of the Son in the uh, community. Um, so these are uh, are joined together within the compositional shape of Matthew's narrative. So just like we see the teachings of Jesus in these uh, blocks of discourse, we are also getting a Christological reflection, a narration and interpretation of who Jesus is, what Jesus said, and the, um, the acts that he uh, accomplished in atonement and resurrection. Uh, another impl a further implication here is that the task of close reading of both Old Testament and New Testament biblical texts is a core feature of understanding the gospel and fulfilling the Great Commission. So both evangelism and discipleship are uh, implied here, or inferred, uh, that we can infer this. Uh, so thinking about the relationship between Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and Matthew 28 and 19 and 20, so thinking about the beginning and end of the gospel as well, when we're looking at the beginning of the gospel, it's implying the ideal reader of the beginning of the gospel is one who knows the scriptures, or if one doesn't, uh, will go find out what those scriptures are. So connecting the story of Jesus also with the story of Israel, the story of what God was doing um, through uh the entirety of redemptive history, connecting that to the work, words, and life of Jesus. Uh, and then also then, by those textual and theological connections between the beginning and end of the gospel, by implication, is that uh, this is the means by which you disciple in the post-resurrection spirit-led community. So the gospel of Matthew itself is a uh, death blow to the idea that we should unhitch or we should um, cut ourselves off from the Old Testament storyline. Um, Matthew has uh, inescapably, inexorably connected the gospel story about Jesus the Christ to the uh, Old Testament storyline, right? And that's an exciting thing that Matthew is doing. Uh, and then finally for today, uh, or this session, is the, one of the implications of this whole whole book book level meaning textual strategy is that seeing the distinct compositional shape of Matthew's narrative allows us to read it on its own terms so this is as we're thinking about how do we keep our understanding of what Matthew is up to uh, anchored in his text when we are thinking about these uh, broad textual strategies uh, in Matthew Mark Luke and John um, especially as we're thinking about a narrative, as we're trying to grapple with narrative features of a particular scene, uh, in light of, we want to do that in light of uh, the purpose that Matthew has for writing and composing this work uh, and for allowing it to unfold in the way that it has, in this distinctly Matthean way. Uh, Matthew is telling us uh, the story of Jesus as the Christ. So one of the things that I want us to think about uh, in the, is that the importance of, as we've been talking about, the importance of reading vertically in the sense of the, the Gospel of Matthew on its own terms, even as we're thinking horizontally in terms of the synoptic issue or the fourfold Gospel as a whole. We want to be balancing those out uh, and keeping those uh, balanced. So Matthew is signaling, Matthew himself is signaling what he's on about. His careful handiwork is all over this uh, Matthean masterpiece. Uh, that we have been thinking about. So what's coming next is a deep dive into the uh, the first chapter, the genealogy and the birth narrative of Jesus as the Christ, the book and the birth of Jesus. Um, so as we're thinking about this, uh, the final implication here, all these strategies helping us see individual texts in the Gospel of Matthew like um, the parables of the kingdom and seeing how they relate to not only the big picture of Matthew, the not only the big picture of a particular discourse, but in light of the whole story of who Jesus is, what Jesus said, and what he accomplished uh, in his incarnation and uh, death and resurrection, and the way that that's connected to the big, the, the grand storyline of what God is doing in the world um, according to the scriptures. All right. Well, thank you for your time today.